So in January, I read quite a bit. I'm quite proud of myself. I didn't read the most that I've ever read, but my average page count and I guess the amount of books that I read also came in higher than like my average monthly 2022 page count by like a reasonably small amount I would say by the equivalent of like one book but it was enough to make me happy anyway and I also found a new favorite book that I think is for sure going to be one of my favorite books of the year. It was one that I really didn't expect anything of as well which is even better but getting straight into those statistics statistics. In the month of January I read 10 books which added up to a total of 3,617 pages and broke down to an average of 116 pages per day. For the star ratings we sadly had one two star but we also had two three stars five four stars and two five stars breaking down to an average of 3.8 per book. For the demographics we surprisingly had four young adults um, but also six adults and for the formats I read seven standardly formatted novels, two manga and I listened to one audiobook. For the genres we had four fantasy, three romance, one dystopian, one fantasy romance and one science fiction. And finally, for the places where I sourced these books from, unsurprisingly for January, nine of them were from my own TBR that existed prior to the start of 2023. Can't believe I'm saying 2023 already. And one of them I have hauled in 2023. So a lot of people were fretting, I noticed, about what their first book of the year should be. And I felt kind of bad because I didn't even really consider that. But I did start the year off strong I guess because I knocked out a really really small book which was Children of the Whales volume 9 and then later in the month I followed it up with Children of the Whales volume 10. I did give both of these volumes four stars so I enjoyed both of them. The ratings for this series for me range between three and five with three being like filler volumes and five being ones that kind of blew me away. I have noticed as the series has gone on either the installments are getting weaker or I'm losing interest a little bit because I, I'm not really rating them five stars anymore. But this is a older teen, so I categorized it as young adult, manga series about a group of people that live on a floating island called the Mud Whale. The Mud Whale is traveling along on the Sea of Sand and it's a very isolated community. So the people of the Mud Whale think that they're the only people that exist in the world up until they find another human being on a scouting mission and they realize that the world is a lot wider than they thought it was. And they also have to swallow a few uncomfortable truths about who they are, um, what the mud whale is and why they live in this isolated community. So the thing that really drew me into this series and continually pulls me back is the art style. It is absolutely stunning but don't let how beautiful it is fool you because something that surprised me about this and something else that I really enjoy about it is that it continues to delve into dark themes um, and at times it's quite gory and bloody. Death is also a central theme throughout this like death and I guess longing and sadness. So it does deal with like I guess some darker topics and sadder topics quite frequently as well. My issue kind of with this is that I'm, I'm just not super familiar with long manga series and at this point I'm about halfway through the series. They think it's going to end at volume 21 or 22 and I've read 10 volumes. I'm just wondering like what the end goal is going to be. I'm just not used to such long form series and series that do tend to be long form like this like paranormal romance I don't enjoy because of that reason like the installments feel kind of episodic where I like the I like series to have kind of like a grand plan and everything work towards that as opposed to I guess meander a little bit more so this is my first experience with a longer manga series and I'm kind of just like seeing how I go. I've invested a lot into these now that I'm halfway through so I don't think I'm gonna give up but yeah these ones I've um, got four stars because they push the plot a little bit. I have read a couple of filler volumes in this series pretty recently which was putting me off even more but yeah this one is moving the plot forward and I really like the villains in this series as well in a way that I just typically like manga and anime villains because they tend to be kind of like chaotic evil with really good hair and really well dressed. The next book that I picked up was a sci-fi which I'm really happy about because I do want to read more sci-fi in 2023 and the one that I started off with was The Galaxy in the Ground Within by Becky Chambers which is the fourth installment in the Wayfarer series. The Wayfarer series is a cozy sci-fi series that is a collection of standalones set in this universe that Becky Chambers has created where lots of species live together 
in, I guess, relative harmony. There is some conflict in those wars in the galaxy, as you can imagine, when the universe is so expansive. But this is generally, like, the series as a whole is generally about our societal issues mirrored in a sci-fi setting. It really puts um, things into perspective that people argue about a lot. And by people, I mean, like, governments and laws and debates that infringe on people's freedom of expression in whatever way. And how, in the grand scheme of things, like it's really irrelevant just let people live you know i always say that this is a sci-fi series for contemporary readers this installment in particular was definitely that because it is set in this kind of like way station where people stop before they travel through wormholes to go to different places in the galaxy. And there's a big technological fault that causes all of the satellites to go down. And this book is about the person who runs this waypoint and three people who are stranded there until the satellites are back up and running and everyone can move on. And it is about them just coming together and sharing their lives and their cultures with each other. Gaining a new perspective on their own problems from people from very different walks of life to them. So it is very much like no plot all vibes. This installment in the series I would say even more so than previous books but I just really enjoy Becky Chambers writing. I really enjoy the way that she discusses and explores the topics covered in her books. I gave this one four stars because it really just doesn't have a plot but I, I just enjoy reading Becky Chambers because her writing is very comforting to me. I then read a book that should have never been published but I enjoyed regardless which was It Starts With Us by Colleen Hoover. This is the sequel to It Ends With Us that absolutely nobody asked for and it shows. So It Ends With Us is the story of, it's a domestic abuse story and it is the story of a woman who goes to the top of a building after her father's death and she grew up in a house where her father abused her mother continuously and he's now died and she's having very complex feelings about this and while she's thinking about everything that her father and his death means to her she meets this guy who's a neurosurgeon and they hit it off and they agree to have no string sex to blow off steam but he is called away to perform an emergency surgery so they never follow through on it and she just thinks of it as a lost opportunity until they meet again about six months later and then during the period of it ends with us the main character lily is also going through some of her old belongings and encounters a series of diaries that she wrote when she was a teenager about a homeless boy that she knew called atlas corrigan so it is a contemporary story that reads like a romance and for me the way that it reads like a romance is very intentional because it puts you in the position of Lily and it shows you how complex abusive relationships are and how it's not as cut and dry as some people think when they will sit there and look upon an abusive relationship and say well if anybody hurt me then I would leave them and you're weak for not leaving them. So for me it Ends With Us had a lot of important things to say. I really appreciated it for that. It Starts With Us is absolutely not that. It Starts With Us is a, a romance sequel to It Ends With Us for fans of Atlas Corrigan. And I'm not ashamed to say that I am a fan of Atlas Corrigan. So I ate this shit up. That being said, it's not very good. The thing about Colleen Hoover that I love is that her writing is so addictive. I'm not here for like a realistic representation of anything. I'm here for super angsty, dramatic just like a book candy and she has a really addictive writing style but what I do always say about her writing is that she does tend to overwrite and this book read to me just like a massive overwrite you could tell that she was going back through it ends with us and picking apart tiny little sentences to form into a novel to give the illusion that this had some kind of plot. That being said, as a big Atlas Corrigan sim, I really enjoyed it regardless and I gave it four stars. In a way that it absolutely doesn't need to exist, you absolutely don't need to read it, but I had a good time with it nonetheless. Moving on to my one true five star read of the month, which is the one that is 100% a new favourite and that is The Love Hypothesis by Ali Hazelwood. This one is a standalone romance that is about a PhD candidate. Once again, sorry if I get the terminology wrong, but it's like a US college system that I'm unfamiliar with. But it's a PhD candidate who starts fake dating a professor at the university where she works. And she's told her best friend that she's going on a date, 
because she used to date a guy that her best friend was really hit off with and she truly had no feelings for this guy that she was dating. She wants him and her friend to move on together and be happy but her friend is abiding by girl code so Olive is pretending to move on so that her friend will date this guy that she used to date. So she's told her friend that she's going on a date but she actually isn't so she's gone to the lab to work when her best friend walks in. So she grabs the nearest person to her that happens to be this professor and kisses him to make it look like they were on a date. So they then agree to fake date because he has had some of the money for his grants frozen because the college sees him as a flight risk and she wants to be dating him for long enough that her friend feels comfortable dating this guy like so that she's convinced essentially that Oliver has moved on. Now this professor is known at the university for making everybody's lives hell. He's not Olive's professor, but anybody whose professor he is absolutely hates him because he's harsh and he cuts straight to the point and he doesn't sugarcoat his shit. So this had one of my favorite tropes or I guess character pairings in a romance. It's the same kind of dynamic as the hating game where you have a guy that everybody hates that actually treats the main character really well despite his reputation and a highly strung main character that can't see what is like two inches in front of her face. There is something about that pairing that I am obsessed with. When the guy keeps treating her well and you know that there's something going on there and he feels a certain way and she cannot see it. I was super dubious going into this one as well because it is well known that this is like Raylo fanfic. It's Adam Driver fanfic and sadly Adam Driver just does not do it for me and one of the things that I struggled the most with throughout this was not picturing Adam Driver because I'm a very visual reader. And so as soon as I knew that this was Adam Driver fic, I could not get him out of my head. But yeah, this was a overwhelming hit for me. This is my hating game of 2023. And if you are a fan of the hating game, I do think that you will also enjoy this one because it has a lot of parallels to the hating game, especially the, the doc, the, Professor Dr. Carlson. His arc is very similar to Josh, I want to say. Um, and so the plot structure is quite similar to Josh. And also the character dynamic of Olive and Adam is pretty much the exact same as Josh and Lucy. So if you're a fan of the hating game, if you picked it up on my recommendation, I do think you'll really love the love hypothesis as well. And don't be surprised when this comes in in my best books of 2023. I then read a book that I'm really unsure at this point whether it was a disappointment to me or not. Because I don't feel like it, it disappointed me per se, but only because it, it just wasn't what I expected. So any expectations I had for it just very quickly went out the window. But that one is Feed by Myra Grant. And this one was actually a gift from Kristen as well. So thank you very much to Kristen for gifting this one to me. It was one that I was very excited to read when I was getting into like super logic based, like really complex, gritty sci-fi. And this series was recommended to me. This first installment was just confusing. So this is set in a, or after a zombie outbreak. It's not an apocalypse because civilization has continued and bloggers are the most reliable source of news because during the zombie apocalypse or zombie outbreak, reporters were trying to cover it up. They didn't believe it was happening. They were doing the whole like, oh, something weird is going on, but stay calm. Everything's going to be fine. And the only people who were telling the truth were the bloggers. So in this book, we are following three bloggers who have been selected to report on a presidential campaign. So the plot line for this is actually actually political. It feels a little bit noir with the writing style. It has a bit of a mystery plot because we're following these three reporters as they're following this presidential campaign, which is continuously being sabotaged. And I guess the main plot structure is trying to find out who is sabotaging the campaign and why. I mean, there's plenty of reasons that they would because the president, the guy running for president um, is more liberal than a lot of people will tolerate even in today's society. And even the fact that he's chosen bloggers to follow him and be like his official press is controversial. So there's plenty of reasons why people would want to sabotage him, but the main characters are just trying to get to the bottom of like what's actually going on. The reason why this confused me so much and why I can't say it disappointed me because it was so different to what I expected is because I expected this to be a, just like a zombie book, you know? And it, it is, there's zombies in it, but this feels more like a speculative. How would society continue and what issues would we face if zombies were a reality that we had to live with day to day? And the zombies do play a, a relatively large part in it. They are 
relevant to multiple conflicts throughout this book but I guess what I'm saying is it's not necessarily a survival story so the the fact that it was set on the backdrop of a zombie outbreak very much felt like it was a backdrop to make the world a little bit more interesting while this presidential like political mystery-esque plotline played out and in terms of plot structures political mystery-esque plots are not something that I typically read so I, I can't say I enjoyed it because I, I don't think I did but at no point throughout this book did I ever want to DNF it because it was it was compelling. It was a bit info dumpy in the way that like Naomi Novik the Scholomance series is info dumpy where we'll go off on tangents that is just like filling in information about the world that isn't necessarily relevant and nobody asked for. So I can't say that I particularly enjoyed the writing style in here. It was also quite cold and impersonal so I didn't really care about the characters which I feel like for me at least is kind of integral when they're continuously being put into a position of peril like I want to care if they live or die and I didn't but it was interesting enough that I never wanted to stop reading it at any point like I never thought I was gonna DNF it so there is a chance that I will continue on to the sequel I have heard as well something that very much interests me is I heard that the third book in this series is very divisive so I want to know what that's about but I can't say that I enjoyed this first one and I ended up giving this one three stars but very briefly I did also also finish in January an audiobook which is half of a book <laughs> that I was listening to or have been listening to since September and that was the Akatar graphic audio that is a full cast like audio performance of A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J Maas. So the reason why I was listening to this in particular is because I wanted to listen to the graphic audios because you know me I'm picky with audiobooks and I love something that is full cast with sound effects and all of that jazz. So I started listening to this while I was walking Brie in September and I've continued to listen to it when I walk Brie but only when I walk Brie by myself and me and Curtis take it in turns or we go together so even though it's only like a four and a half hour audiobook it took me a long time to get through it especially as well because with the music and the sound effects I only listen to it on 1.2 speed because if you speed it up to a certain amount then it starts to distort and it takes away the enjoyment and the point of it being like this immersive experience. I don't really have have anything to say on my enjoyment of it because as you I'm assuming you guys know that I love Akatar. Plot wise I'm also not used to explaining it but it is a young adult fairy romance series. Young adult adult arguably it should have always been adult but I would say that the first book is pretty YA new adult and it's the first book in a fantasy romance series about a girl who accidentally kills a fairy shifter who's in the form of a wolf when she kills him and one of the high lords of the fairy lands comes to claim her life in place of the life that she took so she thinks she's going to die but he actually takes her to live out her life in the fairy lands. So the plot of the actual series is very different to the plot of the first book but that's where we start off and the graphic audios are actually two audiobooks per book so what I essentially listen to is the first 230 pages of Akatar. I gave it five stars but it wasn't a critical process because it wasn't like a critical listening experience. It was just something that I was familiar with that I had on it in the background to enjoy and pass the time while I was walking Brie. So I gave it five stars because that's the written that I gave Akatar and I don't really have much to say about it aside from that I really like Akatar and I really liked the graphic audio experience. If like me you like a full cast audio situation would recommend checking out graphic audio in general um they are doing the Akatar series and I saw an announcement recently that they're also starting to do Red Rising which is another one of my favorite series so I'll probably listen to that when I've made it through the Akatar series. I then picked up a little bit of a wild card which was The Girl Who Fell Beneath the Sea by Axio. This one is a young adult fantasy and this is the absolutely stunning fairy loot edition which I am obsessed with purely because it's coral and turquoise which are two of of my favorite colors. This one is a standalone young adult fantasy that is a like feminist retelling of a Korean legend. So in this world, the village where our main character is from sacrifices maidens to the sea god on a yearly basis to bring an end to the storms that otherwise destroy the land. So this starts off with our main character following her brother into the storm because he is following his beloved who is this year's sacrifice to the sea god. Now the main character knows that this is a killable offense like interfering with the sacrifice is a killable offense. So to save her brother and save his beloved from sacrificing herself she throws herself into the sea and so she makes her way to the sea god's palace 
only to find out that he's asleep with three people guarding him, one of them being the head of one of the noble houses in this um, spirit realm. And that guy who's called Shin, cuts the red string of fate that's tying the main character to the sea god and traps her soul in a cage. So she's trying to claim back her soul and also her voice which disappears with it and then break the sea god's curse so that the village won't have to sacrifice maidens anymore and the storms will stop. So this one is a very similar story to the Winter Night trilogy by Catherine Arden, albeit that is kind of like a, a long form embellished version and also Gods of Jade and Shadow by Sylvia Marino Garcia, but obviously Obviously this is a Korean legend as opposed to Russian in the case of the Winter Night trilogy and Mexican in Gods of Jane and Shadow but this is kind of like a story that follows the structure of a fairy tale and it's also like a fairy tale-esque almost fantasy romance kind of story as well. I was dubious about this throughout the first half because I don't think that the writing style in here is very engaging but there was a whole ton of other stuff that I really enjoyed about this. I really liked the the world building and also the spirit realm which was very reminiscent of Spirited Away which is one of my favorite movies. I liked the characters to an extent but my main kind of argument with this is that it could have been twice the length and fleshed out and like really got me invested and I like the plot structure because I love the Winter Night trilogy, I love Gods of Jane and Shadow and I really enjoyed this in, in the aspect that it is that same kind of story that I have previously enjoyed. The ending as well, like the last 50 pages or so, I realized that I was kind of invested in the story and I thought that the ending was really sweet. The reason why I didn't love the writing style is just because I didn't find it to be particularly engaging. I would have liked it to be more descriptive. I would have liked the pace to be a little bit slower and there was nothing necessarily wrong with the writing style. It just wasn't one that particularly stood out to me in any way or one that made the story particularly gripping, which is sad because I do feel like I would would have enjoyed this a little bit more based on the fact that I've read stories with the same kind of structure and plot to this um, and really really loved them. If the writing style was possibly a little bit more descriptive and the pacing was a little bit slow, it was quite disjointed as well where we seem to pretty much hop between events throughout the novel. So if it was like fleshed out and the pacing in general was a little bit slower, um, I would have potentially enjoyed it a little bit more. But overall, like it was enjoyable. I did like the conclusion of it. And if you are a fan of Gods of Jade and Shadow, you may enjoy this one. And also the reverse is true. If you liked this, then I think you'll really like Gods of Jade and Shadow as well. I then finally finished Eye of the World by Robert Jordan, which is the first book in the Wheel of Time series. This, I still don't know if I can accurately describe the plot of Wheel of Time at this point, but this is set in a world where the events of every age repeat themselves in this constant fight between good and evil. And in every age we have a character reincarnated called the Dragon Reborn who plays an integral role in whether the scales tip more towards the light or dark side with every age. So this is setting up this age's battle between the dragon and the dark one essentially. I'm not sure at this point still whether the dragon is an agent of light or whether he is a pawn to be utilized by either the agent of dark and light, but I feel like the plot of this series is going to be the dragon versus the dark one with in typical fantasy fashion the dragon will eventually prevail but hopefully with some turmoil throughout the middle where we're not sure like which side he's going to pick. Now the dragon isn't the only integral figure in this battle. We do have a cast of supporting characters in here who are all integral to the events of this particular age and the story starts off with a sorceress or an Aes Sedai called Moraine who comes to this village which is very quickly ransacked by Trolloc so she gathers this group of kids, I say kids, like I said, they're aged between 16 and 20-ish, and tells them that the Trollocs are here because of them, and if they travel with her to Tarvalon, which is the seat of the Aes Sedai, then they will be drawing the Trollocs away from the town, um, and it's part of their destiny to do so. So this first book is them, I, I want to say journeying to Tarvalon, it is the beginning of the journey to become an integral part of 
the events of this age. I really enjoyed this one. I gave it four stars overall. There are things that I like and dislike about it. Something that I like is the writing style. It's very reminiscent of like your typical high fantasy style, but it is pretty accessible. It's not difficult to read. It's just slow and a little bit meandering. I've heard this series and the writing style compared to Tolkien quite a lot. I don't I, I agree and disagree. So I'd say I guess that it's kind of Tolkien light because we do have tangents in there but they tend to be like a paragraph instead of two pages if you know what I mean. And I do also think that the fight scenes in here are quite reminiscent of Tolkien because they're very fast paced and written in a way that I would say is not particularly engaging where it's like and then he took his sword and he stabbed the trollic to the left and he slashed the one to the right and then Matt jumped over his head and fired an arrow um, and it's just like a very rapid series of events that to me isn't particularly interesting to read. I enjoyed the first 650 pages more than I enjoyed the last like 100-ish pages of this one because I feel like I was enjoying the really slow pace and introduction into this story in this world and right at the end it felt like we kind of started galloping towards actually having some kind of plot and conclusion and conflict in this book where it makes sense within the within the story why the pace escalated so rapidly but I don't know I guess I was just enjoying like the slow meandering exploration of this world that I felt like we kind of shoehorned the plot in and I would have enjoyed it a little bit more if that whole journey part and also resolving conflict was a little bit more slower paced but I am very excited to see where this goes especially based on the little hints that I feel like I've gathered of what's to come even if it is just like a very minor part of the overall plot and also I'm really enjoying seeing other series reflected in this or I guess this reflected in other series and also the folklore and how that is being drawn into here as well. So a very strong start to the series I would say. I didn't expect a great deal of it because it is the first book in such a long series and I would say that because of that like it delivered exactly what I expected which was an introduction with promise of things to come. And then the final book that I read was one that I thought that I was going to enjoy and I didn't. This was my two star read and that was Priest by Sierra Simone. This is a taboo romance about a priest whose sister was sexually abused. So content warnings, her sister was sexually abused by the priest that was in the church when he was growing up and because of that she committed suicide. So he has devoted his life to God and also the priesthood because he wants to be the kind of priest that a priest should be. He wants to be a good priest and he wants to fight the systemic abuse that's present within the church specifically or especially the Catholic church. But his dedication to his priesthood goes out the window when a woman enters his confessional and um, starts to confess her sins and he is quite attracted to her. I, I didn't like this book. It should have either been a really dirty taboo novella or a romance without the, the emphasis on the smut I feel because the mixing of the two just didn't didn't make sense to me because this woman walks into his confessional okay and she tells him in sordid detail how she slept with a married man and exactly what happened and how good it was and how much she enjoyed it in a way that was just very unrealistic to me and obviously romance isn't necessarily the most realistic genre you're gonna read but I was raised as a Catholic okay and I'm not a practicing Catholic I don't believe in religion as a construct. I just happen to have been christened and went to a Catholic school in both primary school and high school. So it just, there were many things about this that bothered me on that front, but that's not why I didn't like the book. I was more bothered that I was bothered by the book in that regard. But something I guess that, that comes along with that, that bothered me about this is that the way this woman comes into confession and the way that she speaks to a priest was just so disrespectful to me because I felt like she didn't respect the fact that he was a priest, which is fine because you know going into this that it's going to be smut and it's going to be taboo, but it's the fact that this was smut but also about his conflicting feelings between being a priest and wanting to be with this woman, that it tried to make it into a romance and the plot, I don't want to say it was wholesome, but it tried to have a, I guess, non-problematic romance plot alongside this smut which just didn't, it didn't work for me as a romance that ends 
with a happily ever after and these people being each other's soulmates because of the fact that she just walked into his church and straight off like had no respect for his job or his vocation. So the two things didn't add up. If this was a romance, I probably wouldn't have read it if it was just like a regular romance because I, I like Christian romance, not for me. But I feel like it should have gone that route or it should have been just like straight out filthy taboo smart. And the fact that it tried to be both is why I had an issue with it because it didn't make any sense. And then aside from that, this entire book was told from his perspective. So it was just a constant stream of how tortured he is and his whining and moaning about how he wants to keep his job, but he wants the girl. And it's like, guy, you gotta, you gotta quit your job or dump your girlfriend. You cannot have both. Like it's literally not possible. And I understand it's a difficult decision to make. I just didn't want to be in his head while he was making this decision. Cause I was like, just, just, you need to make a decision. So please stop whining and get on with it. So yeah, sadly this one was not for me. I was also disappointed in the writing style because I've read Supplicant by Ciara Simone, which I love. And that one had a very like reverent, decadent writing style full of metaphor about worship because the two characters in that are, um, one's an archaeology professor and one's an archaeology student, like a PhD student. Can you be a PhD of archaeology? I think you can, right? But they both specialised in religious iconography, so I was expecting that kind of language and writing style present in this, because it's a a priest but sadly no it was more of like a, a just like a typical romance writing style which was disappointing so i will probably potentially read more from sierra simone in the future but i won't be continuing on and reading any other installments in this series and now i don't know what to do with this because this is signed and personalized because i met sierra simone at rare last year but i really did think i was gonna love it and it, i just really didn't so those are all the books that i read in january i think i had a very successful reading month overall and i'm also very much looking forward to what's coming in February. I'm just in a really good mood for reading right now. I think it's because I've been reading two books alongside each other again, which I feel keeps the motivation up a little bit because I'm hopping between things. So it helps to... I don't know, like keep me engaged and focused when I'm reading for, I guess, longer periods of time because I have like different genres to switch between. But down in the comments, let me know what your guys' favourite book of January was and also let me know if you have any thoughts on any of the books that I read in January. But aside from that, guys, please don't forget to like this video if you liked it and subscribe if you wanna. If you head to my description box, you'll find a link to my Goodreads Instagram and Twitter if you'd like to follow me on any of those as well as a link to my bookish candle website, the Etsy for that and the 10% off discount code. But that's it for me today guys. Bye. Oh, you bite your friend like chocolate. You say you will go where nobody knows with guns in under our petticoats. We're never gonna quit it, no, we're never gonna quit it, no.